I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, you're right. Last week was a, was an interesting show. He had a lot to say. <laughs> yeah, he sure did. <laughs> I like Christopher, but he's definitely a, a wild child. <laughs> yeah, we hardly had to ask him any questions. He had so much to say. He just kept on going and going. <laughs> he's in the movie uh, Cecil B. or something like that. Uh, Cecil B. Demented, yes. I don't think I've ever seen it. I've heard of it, but I don't, I don't believe I've ever seen it. Uh, well, uh, tonight's guest is uh, Lynn Roberts, and she's the author of Shape Shifting into Higher Consciousness, Heal and Transform Yourself in Our World with Ancient Shamanic and Modern Methods. And also, she has a book coming out with Sandra Ingerman, who's also been on the show. It's called uh, Speaking with Nature, Awakening to the Deep Wisdom of the Earth. I, I believe that comes out, I think, in May. How are you doing, Lynn? Are you there? Great. Hi, Jeffrey. Really nice to join you tonight. Good to have you here, too. I'm glad we finally got this party started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Took a minute there. There was some coyote hijinks there for a minute, but it <laughs> settled down. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Well, um, as far as uh, looking through your uh, bio, all the places you've traveled and the different, like, uh, tribes that you've... Uh, hung out with and discussed uh, shamanism is just amazing. I and mean, it sounds like a movie or something that you would see in a movie. <laughs> Did you go go a bit into some of that history with our listeners? It's definitely, uh, definitely want to hear it from you. Well, I've been very fortunate the last 20 years. Uh, prior to that, I, I had studied Tibetan Buddhism with a Tibetan teacher here in the States for many years. And, 
and uh, was doing energy healing and uh, then really opened to some deep shamanic processes and uh, after the birth of my son, where he and I uh, almost died when he was born. And um, so I started working with John Perkins, who um, uh, had been working with indigenous people for many years, and we traveled together to Ecuador, taking groups uh, many times to the Amazon, deep in the Amazon with the Shuar people, and also uh, in the high Andes with Quechua uh, people, descendants of the Incas, and I've also worked a lot in Guatemala and uh, did some trips as well um, with my uh, expedition uh, partner in uh, Siberia, uh, Bill Pfeiffer, founder of the Sacred Earth Network. So I, I've traveled many different places and have an affinity for certain places, you know, but every place is powerful. And the most amazing thing to me is that these are diversely uh, different cultures. However, uh, they do very similar work in ways. They they all work with the elements, earth, air, water, fire, and they work with spirit. And they all have very similar world views uh, of deep uh, union, interdependence, interrelationship with the earth, and that everything is that we live with in nature is alive and sentient and uh, that we can relate with it. And there's great power and healing accessible to us uh, as we do that. And what what do they say about the earth right now and the times we're going through? Do they have any common message or of anything that they share about the earth and the times we're living in right now? Yeah, definitely. You know, the interesting thing is that so many indigenous cultures the world over now uh, have had a prophecy about these times for a long, long time. And uh, in the uh, in Siberia, it's called Belavodia, which is kind of the equivalent in the Buddhist tradition of Shambhala, this time of enlightened community to arise. And um, with the Quechua people, it's called the Pachacuti. And Pachacuti literally means transformer of the world. And there's a legend there called the eagle and the condor. And the eagle represents the mind. It represents materialism and prosperity. It can represent the, you know, the culture of the north. And the condor represents spirituality and environmentalism and uh, more the feminine aspects and heart. And it's often connected with the uh, cultures of the south. And uh, the Quechua say this is a time when the eagle and the condor can soar in the skies together. That means when heart and mind can be as one and these feminine and masculine forces can come together and spirituality and materialism. Uh, so it's a very powerful time. And, um, you know, I, I was uh, with the uh, Mayans in Guatemala not too long ago. And, um, you know, they're, all of their calendars, uh, a lot of them uh, ended actually in uh, December 21st, 2012. And they said, though, don't tell your, pe- you know, go home and tell your people this is not the end of the world. This is the beginning of a new world, and this is a message that I have heard, you know, um, in, in diverse groups that, that this is a time of great, great change, and, and like any birth, you know, I, I almost died and my son almost died at his birth. Any birth is precarious when uh, an infant is coming to the world, when, when something new is being born, there's, there's often, um, you know, there's always a danger there. And we certainly feel that uh, in our lives and in the world now. We're at incredible uh, precipice environmentally, socially, economically, just about in every way. And people are going through massive personal changes and, um, you know, kind of a strip down of the ego. Um, but with that, there's great potential. Uh, you know, death in other cultures is never just the end. Uh, many cultures re- believe in rebirth and reincarnation. And and when I lived in the whole rainforest in Washington State on the Olympic Peninsula, in fact, I was I just spent the week there. I just got back last night. It, when you look around, there is death everywhere, but it's really inseparable from life. So this is an opportunity to die to old ways of knowing who we are and opening to a new birth, you know, a new birth of us and um, and of our, our world, really, and 
you know, I was thinking about it before I got on, and to me, it's very much like, these days are very much like when we all, you know, many, many eons ago thought the earth was flat. Can we even imagine that now? But that was what people thought, that the earth is flat. And what happens when they discovered that, no, the earth is a sphere? And I, I think we're really in those, in a similar time now where, you know, everything we've been taught about what the world is, about who we are, about, you know, the way everything works, um, I think we're starting to understand and it's already really into, in our new sciences and our quantum sciences that our old paradigms just aren't true. And here we are still living the paradigms in our day-to-day -day life. And at some point, this day-to-day -day reality has to make that shift into these more, uh, these larger ways of understanding ourselves. That has to come into our day-to-day -day lives. So, uh, yes, cultures all over the world see this as a great, great time of change um, with its own perils, but its own opportunities. And it's up to each of us to... You know, we have to grieve our losses and, and feel, you know, the, the suffering around us and the imbalances, but it's a time to really allow that uh, to also wake us up to really seek and restore balance uh, within ourselves and as much as we can in our communities and to open to new possibilities, to open to magic. I, a common message that uh, I've had a guest named Sherry Wild on the show and uh, she's an alien abductee, and she had a message. And I've seen this message with many different people, but the Earth's chosen to go to higher vibrations or to the light more. And I guess uh, I know in my own journey that positivity is a big thing for me to keep up with, to keep in those energy levels and to not sink into the shadow realms as I do sometimes. I think being a Capricorn might have something to do with that <laughs> at times as well. But... I'm noticing lately that there are some great shifts going on that are positive, but I also notice that there are like uh, maybe some negative strongholds and they're, they're around certain kinds of people. Like recently, uh, a lot of the, uh, in the Church of Mavis group, I share a lot of the stuff that some of the right-wingers say, and I'm not even going to say some of the stuff that they say, but they say some of the weirdest, negative, crazy stuff ever. Mm -hmm. Like just an example, just briefly, a woman was assaulted from Craigslist and her baby was taken and the baby died. It was a, like a crazy thing that just happened recently. Some right winger just said something like it was God's justice for blah, blah, blah. It was just so weird. And to me, that's like evidence of that negativity, like maybe sliming through certain individuals or something. But I, I, what do you think about the earth going to like a higher vibration and positivity being the key to that? And some people, are, I guess, are kind of caught up in their own hells or something, and maybe that's what that is when people say weird stuff like that? Well, I think, first of all, this is we have to acknowledge that as, uh, as we move through change, uh, what we're experiencing and seeing play out in the world really dramatically is um, the polarities are becoming more and more extreme. You know, uh, dark and light are just becoming more and more polarized. And part of what I feel is happening, and yes, I do agree and hear that um, from indigenous people that the earth is becoming conscious and, and she's going through a cleansing also. And really, you know, we're not being punished here on earth with all the climate changes and everything like that. It's... It's just this major purification that's happening, and I feel that part of that is the release of old karma. You know, when you think about what's happened, you know, just on our lands in the United States, the level of annihilation and war and environmental degradation, that affects all of us, you know, and we live on that energy every day, and it kind of eats through us. And so I, I think part of that purification is a great karmic release, and um, it moves through all of us, and, and uh, there's great confusion in the world. And, and uh, it can be challenging um, to stay balanced with that. And I find that, you know, there's so many things going on, and, and we're all impacted. And I have Capricorn rising. I'm not Capricorn, but I have Capricorn rising. Okay. And I do a lot of work in training my mind because mind is most vulnerable. And it's really time to move into our hearts and bodies and, 
And, you know, we do have to acknowledge what's happening around us, especially what we come into direct contact with. But, but it's important not to get lost in it because we're just adding to the confusion. And, it, you know, it plays out in many different ways. And um, it's, there are some things we can impact and others we can't. But indigenous people remind us about the power of thoughts and feelings, that those are energy. So the more we entrain our own thoughts and feelings to goodness and, and you know, to uh, love and power and wisdom and balance and harmony, the more uh, we can hold that vibrational quality and the more we can radiate it out, which does have an impact in the environment around us. Uh, we know enough about that now to recognize that, you know, we're not separate beings in the world. We're impacted by other thoughts and feelings and actions, and in turn, uh, we can impact others. And I see this so vividly when I, I teach a lot at the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York. I'll be there this August for shape-shifting into higher consciousness. And Oftentimes, I'm, I'm there uh, during uh, the time that James Von Prog, the medium, is there. And uh, it was very interesting one year because, um, you know, they're working with disincarnate beings all the time. And, um, and we're doing our own work in different ways. And we do a lot of practices where we're embodying uh, non-dual light and co coming to clear states of consciousness and really radiating that out for the benefit of those beyond us. And so uh, this woman uh, was in a dorm with uh, a bunch of uh, James's um, students, and uh, they didn't know which program she was doing. They hadn't talked very much yet, but they said, we'd like to do a seance tonight, and you're welcome to join us. And so they got in circle, and they opened to uh, the spirits who uh, would like to share with them. And they had these spirits come in who said, well, we're on the land and we're seeing these people who are channeling light and we're very, very curious about them and we'd like to know more about them. And this young woman was was really uh, tickled and shocked. You know, she said, I, I knew they were talking about us. You know, so we, uh, the next day she shared that with a circle and we consciously opened, you know, to these spirits uh, who are very drawn to our light. And I, I have many other examples uh, similar to that, too, where we have evidence that, that beings in other realms, and we have to assume that in the physical realm as, as well, are very definitely impacted by the light we radiate. And this isn't like a light of good or bad. This is really moving into the light of source that we're all connected with, that we just have to reconnect with and remember because we all come from essence. Even, you know, the things that we consider most bad and imbalanced and disharmonious in the world, everything comes from source, just like everything that we've created uh, materially on this planet as, as artificial as it may appear um, comes from the earth. Everything comes from natural elements, ultimately, and everything ultimately comes from source. Uh, well, one thing that uh, I want to talk about, uh, I, I discussed with you about, and I, I mentioned on the show about my stepfather passing away last week. Uh, since, since my early 20s, uh, I, I'm a testicular cancer survivor. When I was 17, I had mm -hmm. testicular cancer, and I've been healed over... 20 years, and sh that was when I pretty much got introduced to the spiritual realms where I, I found the great spirit, so to speak, uh, going through chemo and all that stuff, and mm -hmm. um, during that time, I was in the comic books and uh, used to read a lot of Anne Rice books and stuff like that, and I kind of grasped onto those characters when I was going through that, um, and I said a prayer to be a superhero. And uh, I was healed, and then several uh, about a year later, my dad passed away, and I had to go through. I went through a divorce as well, so I started uh, experimenting with drugs on some level. I'd never touched drugs ever in my entire life because I was always afraid to. Because I thought my dad told me he would shoot me, so I, be I believed it. So I never did them. But when he died, I did. A lot, I experimented a lot, and I've, I've been off uh, hard drugs for about 20 years now, and I only advocate weed. And, uh, well, basically, after all that happened, I started seeking the spiritual and reading a lot of books on the occult, and I started to have experiences to where UFOs 
came to where I lived over my home, and multiple witnesses saw these with me, my mother, my brother, friends, and they, they said that, uh, some friends said that it seemed like I was attracting them, and it felt like that. And it really, uh, I guess, freaked me out, and I had a lot of fear and anxiety, and I, I became kind of agoraphobic and a hermit, and uh, pretty much, uh, well, during that time, I had seen some light beings after my dad passed away, uh, beings that were made completely out of light. And uh, a friend also saw one of those with me. We saw it. We were driving down the road, and we saw a big light being standing on the clouds, like shaking its finger at us, like, no, no, no. And uh, we had been, you know, partying and stuff like that, so I guess maybe that's what it was talking about. But later, I thought maybe it was my my father. And recently, uh, oh, yeah, there were some times when I, when I would see the light beings in the sky, and I came across a book by Jeffrey Mishla called Roots of Consciousness, and there was an astronomer that said some stars are indeed deities. And I came across that when I was seeing those light beings. Well, anyway, uh, many years passed, and uh, sometimes I'll still see a UFO, but my back in those days I saw a lot of weird uh, entities or beings, different types. And these days I don't, I haven't seen much of anything but an occasional UFO once in a while where I'm at in Florida. But uh, what I was getting to is after my stepfather passed away, I came across a book called The Afterlife of Billy Fingers by Annie Kagan. And mm-hmm. I, have, you, have you ever heard of that book or read it? No, I haven't. Well, basically she's a, a singer-songwriter and her brother passed away uh, and he got hit by a car. And he he came to her and she wrote a book. And usually uh, I don't read those kind of books and I just kind of dismiss them. But I started reading it and suddenly weird little synchronicities started happening. Like, for instance, after my stepfather died, I was sitting uh, here at my house and I started thinking about his watch. And something was like, I want you to have my watch. And I'm sorry, watch after your mother. Uh... I'm sorry for the way I treated you, forgiveness. And it was like, it was, it was like I guess it was him, but I'm always kind of doubtful at that. Like, am I going crazy? What the hell is that? Well, anyway, I picked up the phone and called my mom and told her about it. And she goes, you won't believe this. She's in another city. She goes, you won't believe this. But I, I was just standing here looking at his watches and trying to decide who I wanted to give them to. And I said, well, Mom, you know I'm not making it up because I don't even wear a watch. I don't even like watches. I don't. <laughs> so, but in that book, by Afterlife of Billy Fingers, a lot of weird little things like that happen. And then he talks about uh, getting a light body. So there was an experience where I had last week where I went outside and I looked. Here in Florida, you can see, like, uh, the stars, and it's like a beautiful view at night. And I just, it seemed like I saw these tiny little stars everywhere that weren't stars. And it was kind of like I viewed the earth and then a staging area where people go with, when they die. And I guess they go through like a life review or whatever. But he talked about them going there and then light beings uh, coming to help them on some level. And But I, I just feel like on some level it's definitely true because I've seen them and then that book kind of sparks some more weirdness with it. But I was kind of curious, and of course in shamanism I've heard of luminous beings and things like that, but I'm kind of curious to what your perception is on light beings and, and all that. Well, um, first of all, I, I'd really like to say that, um, you know, you've had quite a journey and I really honor um you know, I know uh, from personal experience, it takes a lot of bravery to move through those spaces. <laughs> and, you you know, you had loss also. That provoked a lot. And uh, so I just want to honor your own journey. And also that because of your journey, you're really uh, propelled to, um, you know, uh, bring uh, some wisdom out into the world and to help facilitate these shifts into understanding ourselves in more broad ways. So. Thank you, you know, for your own journey. And, you know, in shamanic culture is what you experienced at a very young age uh, with getting cancer at a young age and your dad dying and everything you've gone through would be called an initiation. And unfortunately, we don't have, you know, we're just barely starting to understand those processes here. 
And uh, in other cultures, uh, for instance, uh, when I was in Siberia working with very old um, shamans in their 80s, uh, they, they had talked about the shamanic illness, and they wouldn't even work with someone who hadn't had the shamanic illness. And the shamanic illness meant you had some kind of near near death or, um, you know, life-threatening situation happen or you had some kind of, you know, transpersonal fragmentation uh, that we might call a nervous breakdown here or like semi-psychosis. You know, to them that's, um, you know, a recognition that the spirits are knocking on your door and uh, those are the people they recognize as the potential shamans in their cultures. So, again, this would be a very, very valuable thing for us to understand here that when we go through those kinds of, you know, uh, major, major life passages and we end up being cracked open, literally, it feels like that, and we don't know ourselves the way we did before. And we're all going through that in some way now, our whole world is. But but this is, you know, a death of in a lot of ways, but it's also an opening, you know, to uh, some very, very powerful things. And um, my story is that I, when I was a child, I had telepathic communication with star beings for years when I was a young child. And, um, you know, this went on for a very long time. And I just had these, this family who was in another part of the universe. And they would speak with me through words sometimes telepathically. And other times it was just a feeling. I could feel them with me. And other times I would hear tones in my ears or music, and I knew that was them, and they were just kind of co- coexisting with me. And, you know, I talked to them and asked, you know, I didn't understand how that worked, you know. It's like, well, how can you be with me and be in a distant part of the universe at the same time? And yeah. and most of the time I just got the answer that, you know, you just can't understand it all with your mind. It just doesn't work that way, you know. And later, uh, I forgot about that when I was in high school, and then when I was studying psychology um, uh, in college, I, I remembered those experiences, and I thought, oh, my God, I must have been dissociating, you know, I, because there's no cultural context for that. I, I couldn't really claim that at that point as a valid experience. And then later, though, when I went through, you know, and not that I wasn't spiritually open still, I was connecting with Buddhism and, you know, I've had spiritual experiences my whole life, but I went more deeply into it again when I studied Buddhism and I lived in India in my early 20s for almost a year and and many other things, but I started um, understanding that, uh, you know, I was having valid experiences as a child. And uh, where would I have, you know, I was raised Catholic, so it certainly wasn't in my, you know, that, that paradigm, these light beings, uh, these, these uh, stellar starry family. And, um, and I've experienced them also in my adult life after my son was born, which I described. Um, I had a lot of experiences uh, with light beings. And I also had other experiences that were confusing and scary, as you described. And I think what happens is, and I know Stanislav Grof, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with with his work, but um, uh, he has... Is that, is that again? Uh, Stanislav Grof, G-R-O-F. And he's known for transformational breath work and also for uh, describing these, um, what are they called, spiritual emergence and also spiritual emergency. And a spiritual emergence is, um, you know, it's like the boundaries of our ego kind of break down and we pop into these transpersonal realms of of reality and um, they can be a, a little overwhelming. I guess you can liken it to what people talk about with the Kundalini awakening you know, with this energy uh, coiled in the base of the spine from the yoga tradition, very, very powerful spiritual energy. And when it awakens, it rises up the spine and it goes uh, through the, the head space and down. And it, I think the settling space is eventually in the heart. When it gets into the mind, it can be uh, really uh, kind of pop you open and you can perceive many, many things. And and you're kind of, um, you know, um, sometimes it can be an extreme opening and it can be precarious and you can kind of go off the deep end sometimes. You know, it's for me, I had a nine-day period where I could barely stay in this world because I was 
continuously talking with spirit beings. And I had these two little kids, my children, and um, I uh, really had a hard time navigating both realities. I had to do a lot of things over the months and years to get really grounded. And that's when I decided to uh, actively start working with shamanic people because I could, within my culture, just think, oh, well, I'm having a nervous breakdown and get medication or something. Or I could really look at cultures who knew what this initiation was and how to work with it. And um, the amazing thing was when I started working with indigenous cultures, I realized that every single culture on our planet, original culture, has in their cosmology relationship with star beings. I mean, it's 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 there, you know, and it's nothing uh, weird or it's nothing uh, really, um, you know, out of the realm of reality at all. It's very much a part of their day-to-day life that there are star people and that there are ancestors and there are other beings and there are many things, you know, and in the Amazon with the shuar, uh, John and I have talked to the shore, and they, they talk very um, commonly about these spheres of light who show up in the night, and they can be like glowing kind of white um, goldish balls of energy, or they can be blue balls. And I've seen these very vividly myself also. When I lived on a mountain in New Hampshire, I've seen them in the sky above me, and I saw one right outside my window, literally, and like this physical ball of light, and I was not in an altered state at all. In fact, I was just talking on the telephone with someone, and this ball of light moved across my windows, you know, and I I know they're conscious of me as well. And um, so this is this is very, very real stuff, and I feel that this is part of what, you know, these times are about opening to, but I think some of us went through these openings, um, you know, um, within, you know, decades prior to now, and uh, they can be very, uh, as I said, precarious. But I think we've, we're all learning that we can integrate these better, and I think with the shifting frequencies of the planet, the veils are really getting thinner, and it's coming out in our sciences. It's coming out everywhere. I mean, Catholics now are talking about ETs, and, and it's it's in our realm of reality, and it's something we can integrate now in um, in very different ways. Definitely, uh, Jay, uh, my co-host Jay McNicholas. He, he can only stay for a short while because of his job, but I want to get make sure he gets some questions in. Are you, are you still there, Jay? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, yeah, I, on the initiation that you were just talking about, I kind of agree with with what you're saying there. I won't speak to people on the UFO thing if they haven't had certain experiences or if they haven't read certain books on it. Uh, but I'd like to ask you, going back to like the earth changes we talked about a little while ago, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Hopi. The Hopi have the five different world ages, and four of them have, we've got passed through already, and they've been destroyed by fire and ice, water, and fire again. In your experience with the, the tribes you were with, did any of them have any kind of ancient stories about how the earth has gone through several changes and what might the next change be and what they think about that? Yes, um, you know, the Pachacuti with the Quechua people, this is the fifth Pachacuti, and, um, you know, they say that this will be characterized by, um, you know, it can be characterized by uh, great imbalances coming in. I don't um, think it exactly parallels to what you're describing with the Hopi, but, um, you know, each group has their own, um, you know, stories about the uh, many different realities and worlds that we have been through on this planet Earth. And, um, you know, I think it varies depending on which culture you're you're working with. Mm-hmm. And th- there are also, uh, this is kind of a weird story, but it's the myth of Apollo's daughters. They're chased by Zeus, and then he, he finds them, and then Apollo hides them, and then Zeus finds them again, and then finally he hides them in the, in the stars as the Pleiades constellation. There's that same story is also reflected in the American Indian myths and in the Australian Aboriginal myths. Have you found any myths or stories that were like exactly similar to something you heard from Greek or Roman or even you know, biblical type stories? Hmm. Well, I'd have to think about that. I, yeah, I'm not sure, but that that's fascinating, isn't it? Um, yeah, how well, that same story can go across yeah. so many cultures that had allegedly no contact, and they have the same virtually exact word for word story across three continents. 
Well, for one thing, you know, um, we're starting to learn that there are a lot of land connections and that people, you know, uh, contrary to what some people thought, people were really all over the planet, first of all, and Mm -hmm. uh, traveling a lot, you know. And also, I know the Maya tell us that, you know, Atlantis, actually when Atlantis sunk, that uh, these groups... um, disseminated and and the Hopi, the Maya really feel that they're connected with the Hopi, the Maya I have talked to and worked with, with the Hopi Mm -hmm. and also the Tibetans, you know, so you see those similarities. In fact, I think it's with the Hopi and the Tibetans, there are some of the the words that are actually similar in some of the iconography, you know, you you see this. And and also, you know, you've got to think about this, too, that we're multidimensional beings and indigenous people naturally work in this way, and that includes telepathy and thought transference. And, for instance, in, the, uh, in Ecuador, the Amazonian shamans will actively communicate with the Andeans uh, telepathically, you know, through journeying, through shamanic journeying, because time and space isn't an obstacle. So there are many different ways that that communication and unity occur, you know, between diverse peoples and diverse locations. Yeah, I have to agree. And some of that's actually been proven with the Human Genome Project. When I was in college, I had a class on ancient Asian art. And I wrote a story on an ancient Japanese culture called the Homan, who started around 14,000 BCE and go all and. Their their artwork, it seems to be travel Asia across the western United States and part of Central America and north northern South America, then back up through America and over to Europe. And they used to have a trade where they would they would use a dugout canoe, the the Homan people, and they would travel across the Aleutian Land Bridge and come over to Alaska and Canada and and trade with the people that they met on the way and interbred with them as well, and then going all the way down to like about Peru and then back over through, you know, the Polynesian Islands back home. And they kept doing this. And the Human Genome Project has proved that the, some of the natives of American, North American, South American, and Central American tribes are genetically similar to Japanese and Chinese gene types, genome types, which I thought was, was fascinating because before we think, well, there's no way they ever came across here. There's no proof of it. Well, now we do have that proof. Right, right. Now, that is fascinating. And and also that, you know, uh, people all over the world, original peoples, were tuning into really, um, you know, just tuning into what is. And, and, for instance, you know, every culture that I've worked with does have a prophecy for these times, and the prophecy is slightly different, you know, depending mm-hmm. on which group you're working with, but they all have prophecies about this great time of change, you know. So, um so they're all really tuning into uh, reality, and um, you know we're all really working with the same energies, and you know there are just different words and, and slightly different stories and understandings about it. Yeah, and if, if they're all right, we hope that they're right that it's going to be an, an era of peace and prosperity and that kind of thing, because uh, a lot of the prophecies are you know that the world's going to end and it should have ended in 2012 and yada yada. I'm hoping it's it's more more beneficial. Um, but with that, I'm going to have to go because I have to head out to work and get myself ready. But it was great <laughs> to meet you and talk to you. Thank you very much for your yeah. answers. Yeah, great to talk to you. All right, thank you. Here today. Stay All right, thanks, Jeff. We'll talk to you next week. All right, stay out of trouble. I'll try. <laughs> bye, bye, everybody. <laughs> so I noticed in your yours. Oh, first off, so how did you and Sandra Ingerman get together for this this book? How did that come about? Well, that's an interesting story. Um, I moved to the Ho Rainforest uh, through auspicious events um, uh, on January 5th, 2012, and this is the largest temperate rainforest in the world. When I lived on the East Coast, I grew up in New Hampshire. I had never heard of the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State or the Ho Rainforest, um, and many people <laughs> I present this to back east um, haven't either, but uh, it's an amazing place, temperate rainforest. And um, so I lived as far in as you can go on a private strip of land in between state and national forests, uh, really on the edge of the wilderness. And um, within that first week of moving there, I had a dream. And I had met Sandra about, oh, a decade maybe prior to that in Vermont. 
and and only once, you know, but I, I really respect and, um, you know, I uh, think she does really beautiful work in the world, and I know many people do. And um, so I had a dream about Sandra and I, and I saw us working on a project together, and we looked really happy uh, working on this project. So I woke up from that dream, and a lot of my dreams I have manifested or have have manifested for me. I really, um, my dreams are real tracking signs. They're a very powerful part of my life. And so I thought, well, that was a really nice dream, so maybe I'll contact contact Sandra and see what she feels about this and invite her to uh, do a project with me. So that's how this book came about. I contacted her and she was really excited to uh, participate uh, with me and we decided to write a book together. And the beautiful thing about the book was here I was in this amazing, pristine environment, really unique um, place um, with old growth forest and pristine glacial waters and uh, elk and many different other kinds of uh, wildlife. And Sandra, Sandra lives there too, right? No, she lives in a totally different locale. She lives in New Mexico, oh, okay. in, near the high desert and mountains uh, of New Mexico. So the beautiful thing is in this book, Speaking with Nature, we're each writing about nature beings in our diverse locales. And we, uh, you know, they complement each other and they bring in different teachings from nature and also ways that people can really move into the deep spirit of the nature where they live. Even if you live in a city, you know, we're in the city, we, um, you know, we can't dismiss the plants in our home and, and the sky and the insects and the, the, their city parks and there's flowers growing in the flower boxes and there's birds that live in the department stores. I mean, nature is all around us and we are nature. So, so the book is basically, uh, like a compendium to tapping into the, the spirit medicine of like, for instance, you have chapters called Snowy Owl and uh, Black Bear, Corn, Elk and Snake. Any way I can get any kind of wisdom like this, I'm all over it. Uh, I don't, I have some cards I'm looking at now that uh, are kind of similar. The uh, Jamie Sands, the Sacred Path cards. Yeah medicine cards that they tap into the the same you know type energies mm -hmm. and the, those are great and this book is great as well and it's, it's hard to find this kind of stuff unless you're just really looking for it i like collect it like indiana jones uh -huh. <laughs> like if i could find it like uh recently clifford mahooty uh did a uh a, a seminar on the zuni and the star people like any of that stuff, like uh, they're rare to find, like DVDs of people talking about stuff like that or books even. I mean, there's more books than DVDs, of course, but if any of it pops up into the uh, the stream, I'm I'm on it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And, you know, we, we were just, uh, I think, both of us deeply changed by this process, too, because what we did was for each of our nature beings, and some of them, you know, we're, we're from other locales, for instance, the snowy owl, and I wrote about Nunkwe, the earth goddess of, uh, of the Shuar and the Amazon, and a few uh, different elements came in. But we completely mused this book, just the way the book was incepted. It came out of a dream, so we each kind of felt what nature beings were calling to us, and those were the ones we wrote about, and what we did was amuse deeply into these, and I spent so much time uh, outside with these nature beings in the in the rainforest, and just went deeply into a dreaming process with them for them to teach me what they wanted to share, and through my own experience, also these deep transformational teachings about living on this planet, and also uh, the deep message that everything is alive, really alive. And and again, this is part of our paradigm shift: is that you know we have amazing animal communicators. I don't know if you know of the work of Anna Breitenbach in South Africa. She's doing just a beautiful, astounding work with telepathic communication with animals, wild animals, as well as domestic animals. And, um, you know, and we have evidence out about, you know, plants and uh, the sentience of plants and how you know, plants, when somebody pours hot water down the drain, you know, the algae down the drain, well, the house plants will react, you know, when the, when the algae is killed in the, in the sink drain. I mean, it, just amazing intelligence and life all around us. 
And when we start to really tune into that, um, it changes us. It changes us in a really fundamental way because we are part of that life too. And we feel so disconnected these days, you know, um, and that's part of our paradigm of separation that we're not part of the earth and that we can do anything we want to the earth, you know, because it's it's a commodity and, and we walk around in shoes and we're heel pounding. We're just slamming our feet in the earth and that's a... That's a consciousness, of a, a dominating consciousness. When I work with Tuvan shamans on the Asian steppe, the shamans have these, these big boots, these big um, boots with a curled up toe. And I ask them, it's like, wow, that's, that's really unusual looking. And, and what is that about? You know, because everything in these cultures has a meaning. Everything has a symbology. And they said, well, that's about, that's a reminder to us to walk softly on our mother. We walk softly on the earth. We're in a relationship with the earth, and all the shamans are all about, you know, maintaining that balance between people and nature and the spirits and the cosmos. You know, that, that's their job. They're mediators um, and keeping the community in balance with the earth. So, um, yeah, it was a really beautiful experience, and, and it's not just about what these nature beings that we wrote about can share with people, and there's so many teachings in that, but for each chapter, um, and we each wrote uh, half of each chapter, we offer um, practices that people can do at home to connect with their own nature beings. And some of these practices are, you know, we encourage people to get outside as much as possible. I spent the whole afternoon outside here, and um, I was also in the rainforest all week outside most of the time. Getting outside is really, really important, really, in those elements. And um, But also we can do these by closing our eyes and going deep into our imagination, you know, what we call the shamanic journeying state. So give a lot of hands-on practices for people to, to really shift into those places themselves and to also harness the incredible wisdom and power and energy and healing that's available to us all the time that's around us and that can really assist us in understanding how to move through really massive change on personal and collective levels that can be very, very challenging for us. Nature is here. The spirits are here to support us. And, um, you know, it's really important that we take advantage of that and, and open to that intelligence what is your uh, what do you think about uh, drumming? Uh, there's a Michael Harner book I believe is Cave in Cave in the Cosmos, something like mm-hmm. that. It's like his book that just came out. But there's a lot of experiences talking about drumming, to where uh, he basically says that drumming can uh, give you some of the same experiences as uh, psychedelics would on some level. And there are stories in there of some shamans who. Uh, were drumming and doing some pretty ex- extraordinary things, and it, I can't remember if they actually claimed that they physically traveled or if it was astral, but it was some pretty profound things. And I have some drumming CDs, and I've listened to them, and they make me feel good and stuff. But I don't like do anything too profound, like I would say back in my early days on shrooms or something like that. <laughs> but I'm kind of <laughs> curious, what do you think about drumming? And is is it, is it as profound as let's say doing some type of psychedelic plan or something? Well, drumming is very, very profound. First of all, they've done studies on drumming. drumming that rhythmic beat is um, really physiologically healing for us. It'll shift your brain waves, and it also lowers your blood pressure, and, um, you know, it's a stress reducer. And uh, so it has healing effects for the body. You can feel that, that vibration. And uh, it originated, um, well, the word shaman originated with the Tungus people in Siberia, and those are definitely drumming shamans. Not all shamans uh, drum, use the drum, but um, there are different methods of accessing expanded reality. But the drum is a very, very powerful one. The interesting thing I find is after working in Siberia, I traveled extensively over the uh, Asian steppe, um, uh, and into Mongolia with uh, nine shamans uh, in Siberia at one point, and um, we did ceremonies at, in every village that we stopped in, and, and we did overnight ceremony on a, a mountaintop at one point. And um, the amazing thing was that uh, these these nine shamans drummed, but they don't drum in the ryth- rhythmic beat that people are taught oftentimes in workshops in the states. 
they all had their own rhythm and pattern of drumming, and they all had their own song. They were channeling their ancestors and the spirits, and they all did it differently. And it was like this wild cacophony, just wild, you know, so it's very, very different. Um, But, yes, the drum can move you into ecstatic state and open up, you know, kind of part those veils between worlds because those worlds are always here. We have to remember that, that even if we're not aware of them, they're here with us, um, and the uh, indigenous people view that, you know, kind of parallel to this mundane, ordinary reality that we live in are many different realities, you know. Uh, I call them the mythical realms that coincide everyday reality. They're always here. And, um, you know, I go through life just opening to those, not to the, you know, after a while, I, I really had to learn, as I said, to to ground the energies that I was working with because it, it made it difficult for me to stay in this reality, and that doesn't work, you know. So uh, integrating those in a way that you can access and be a part of that larger reality without losing touch here is very important, you know, and um, I think it's very beneficial to travel to other worlds. On the other hand, most of my practice these days is to really embrace and embody the expanded reality that we live in all the time. And that's what part of this work with nature is about. And, um, but you can, yes, uh, I know, um, you know, uh, uh, working with plant medicines like that and plant spirits, you can have extreme uh, kind of views, windows into other realities and participating with the spirits. And you can also do it in many ways. Uh, you don't need to ingest anything. Oftentimes you can just hold uh, the plant in your palm or put it to your forehead or put it to your heart or speak to your house plant or, or, you know, and just enter those places. They're very accessible to us. And that brainwave shift, you know, I think they've shown that children are naturally in these extended states. And as you know, probably that a lot of children, and this is true of me, have have, you know, what psychologists would call imaginary friends, um, you know, and so we were naturally open to expanded realities. I know I was. I talked to star people when I was young for years, you know, and and so we're naturally open. It's only through our condition, our social and cultural conditioning, that those doors start getting closed. So uh, I think that's why we find in our culture we seek out, you know, a lot of times these... Uh, plant spirits and and drugs to open up those realms. I think a lot of our, not all of it, but uh, a lot of our drug culture and and alcohol also in every culture are spirits. You know, why does the the word alcohol, why is uh, uh, another word for that spirit? Because it opens those gateways. Um, But so I, I feel that a lot of what we don't even understand about ourselves is that we're seeking transcendent reality because it's not natural for human beings just to live in a kind of a flat reality, you know, where we're just in this mundane material world and that's it. That's just not natural because it's just not the way we are. So we're seeking transcendence and there are many ways we do that and we can get confused along the way. But I think that's the power uh, and magic of things like uh, Reiki, you know, is in the mainstream now. And 26 years ago when I started doing Reiki, people thought it was a cult, you know. And Tibetan Buddhism is firmly anchored in this land now. And shamanism now uh, is 20 years ago when I started uh, working with shamanic people. People thought I was nuts, you know, but now shamanism is, is coming into the mainstream as well. So the climate's shifting because we really have to integrate these spiritual realities into the everyday, and we're gaining uh, ways to do that. And one thing I do want to say about drumming, too, it's a powerful, powerful method of opening to other realities, but you, um, you know, you don't want to become dependent upon a drum because, again, it's very natural. When I work with the Quechua people in the Andes, they do these powerful healings with people um, where they apply, they have them naked standing, and they'll work on three to five people at a time, three shamans of a family that I've worked with many years. 
and they apply plants from the body, and they'll they'll come I blow with the breath of the spirit, sacred waters, and they're calling in the spiritual energies, and they even blow fire. They engulf their clients in huge balls of fire by blowing through a lit candle, this plado, which is sugarcane alcohol, very sacred to that culture, and um, they feel they're shape-shifting into the spirit of the volcanoes to uh, bring that spirit close to their, their client and help them to shape-shift from imbalance, you know, to health and wholeness. And the interesting thing is that while they're doing this, you can tell these shamans are deep in ecstatic trance. They're, they're working with their spirit guides. They're seeing them. They're shape-shifting into them. At the same time, they'll turn around and crack a joke in the middle of it, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, they're really, really down to earth in that the spiritual world is not separate from the material world. And these cultures have a relationship to their land. They talk to the volcanoes every day. And, and this is true in Siberia as well. I've traveled extensively, and there are markers all over the land where the topography changes and where the spirits of the land change and where you stop the car and you get out and you do ceremony, you know, and you greet and feed the new spirits of the land and, and ask them to welcome you so you can continue your journey. You know, it's all integrated into uh, ordinary life. And, of course, a lot of uh, all indigenous people have experienced, you know, um, you know, their, their ways uh, taken from them and these, these um, natural uh, ways of being uh, in harmony with the earth and with the spirits have been, you know, almost destroyed. And so a lot of these cultures are really reviving this. And this is part of the power of shamanism in the States and Europe, too, is that we're starting to understand, to honor again, our indigenous peoples, and um, that's very, very important. Definitely uh, needs to be uh, more uh, more wide and known for sure, and uh, I'm kind of curious, uh, when it comes to shape-shifting, mm-hmm. I, that obviously is more like channeling an energy of a particular animal or a state of consciousness. It's not... Uh, of course, some people would think it's actually turning into the animal, but it's not that. It's just the energy, taking on the energy. Or when, like, a native dresses up like the animal, they become that energy, right? It's not the actual physical change, is it? Well, I think it can be both. For instance, a woman I worked with, a shaman in Siberia, uh, I presented her uh, with uh, a necklace, a, a rainforest seed necklace from the Amazon uh, that I got from some of the Shore people as a gift for her, and she cried when I gave it to her and told her where it was from because she said, "Oh, you know, I." And this is translated, of course, for me. She said, "I travel to the, the the rainforest all the time as a ball of light. I've never been there in in my physical body." But I travel there as a ball of light, and I know that is my true home. Now, isn't that amazing? And here the, you know, the shore and the Amazon sea balls of light. So that's a shapeshift, you know. Um, and, yes, I believe this is possible. And, and what are we seeing, you and I, when we're seeing balls of light? You know, what is that? And, and I've heard profound stories of, of shamanic people sh- literally shapeshifting physical form. And I think ultimately that's possible because we're one with everything. We're not separate from that, you know, that uh, panther or whatever it is. Um, but shape-shifting can happen on many levels. And when the shamans are engulfing, you know, clients in, in balls of fire, that's a shape-shift. That's invoking the energy of the volcano to shift the energy field of the client because it's it's seen that, our beliefs are held, you know, our beliefs really um, affect our, our own shape, how we, how we manifest, you know, in our personal lives. And we can see how our beliefs culturally have manifested, you know, um, a culture that sees itself as separate from nature and the impact of that. So shape-shifting is a way of shifting those core kind of, you know, beliefs and attitudes and energies that hold the template for physical reality. So physical reality can change. So when you receive shamanic healings, and I've seen it and I've done it, my, you know, been a hollow read for it myself and working with my own clients that whether it's doing uh, straight Reiki, I've seen profound, profound, immediate shape shifts, 
healings, spontaneous, miraculous healings. I don't see miracles as extraordinary. They're part of our human nature, part of our birthright. And so those are shapeshifts. And we can all, you know, shapeshifting is about applying intention, intent and energy to shift form, to shift physical form. And all indigenous people talk about the dream, that the dream is very, very important, that the dream is our thoughts, our feelings, our attitudes, our wishes, and how this really um, is what manifests our material world, and they are inseparable. So it's, it's a very important thing for us to start to connect with this ancient wisdom and start to understand our own power to shapeshift and that, you know, even things that appear impossible, you know, if we apply our intent and our energy and and uh, just open to positive uh, change, uh, I believe profound things are possible. And, and again, I've seen pretty outstanding things in my life, you know, i I really have high hope for the world because um, I've just seen miraculous, uh, beautiful parts of our reality that I know are really wanting to come in now amidst all the other um, difficulty. And I think part of that difficulty is making itself so pronounced in that, you know, the tragedies and the darkness in our world because we have to understand that that's, that's part of us too. You know, we have to find a way to love those parts also. And that's not easy to do, but um, we have to find some harmony within us. Um, And again, that radiates out to uh, affect greater balance uh, on the world around us. I'm remembering all the times I've seen those weird balls of light and the red and blue, (laughs) like you said. I've seen those too. So when you first said that you saw the the red or the blue ones earlier, I started like I automatically went to that time and place where I saw those when we were staring at them with a group of friends. But now it's like I guess they're I jokingly have said on afterlife uh, shows with other guests that we're celestial uh, golden light tadpoles when we die. <laughs> but uh, so I guess I. I have you seen the uh, Ron Howard movies, Cocoon 1 and 2? Uh, yeah. yeah. I the first one. I think the light people are us without our bodies. Uh, that's what I think. I think that's what we are. I don't. I can't. Maybe I can't say that for everyone, but I think that may be part of it. Do you think that's what we are? Is we're those light yeah. people? Yeah. Yeah, I believe, you know, that um, we're really, uh, what this is all about is for us to start to understand our real essence that we are light beings ourselves and that we, um, you know, this is a time as a frequency shift on the planet that we might, and we are already seeing it, that the energetic qualities of who we are are starting to become more palpable for us. I mean, people are gaining uh, intuitive powers more easily and, you know, I think, uh, by the way, too, just by spending a lot more time on the earth and opening to nature, that happens naturally you know, and we start to attune with those frequencies, very important. When we feel challenged and fearful and confused, go out on the earth, spend 40 minutes on the earth, and your whole consciousness will completely shift, and you'll feel that support and guidance of the earth and that expanded sense of things, which which really changes, you know, how you experience yourself on the planet. But, yeah, we are them, and I think part of our paradigm shifts are we – You know, we want to think and kind of compartmentalize and kind of chop everything up so we can understand it. And I believe the beauty and power and magic and mystery of who we really are and the world that we live in, a part of that is that we can't understand it only with the mind. Like the Star Kings told me when I was a kid, you can't. It's not just about a, a mental understanding. We have to open our heart and our whole beings and experience it and open to it because it's a participatory thing where it's a co-creation, you know, of who we really are. And, for instance, another example is when I was having those out there experiences, you know, those nine days when my kids were little, just really cracked open and talking with spirits and seeing light beings and all kinds of things. Um, I also had the experience of casting souls and I would be in my body, and suddenly I would feel this really intense energy, like, uh, you know, and sound in my ears, like this roaring sound. And I knew it was coming, and I just, my body would freeze where it was. I couldn't do anything. 
And then I would feel myself eject out of my body, and I would be traveling really fast through these tubes of, I don't know, they're kind of like in uh, contact, actually, you know, these um, wormholes. And, uh, I really related to that movie because it's like, oh, my God, I've had that experience, you know, and to other realities. And I would be face-to-face with someone who was just about to die, and I would feel this love just move through me, and it would move through me like a force and help move this this spiritual uh, aspect of the person out of their body, out the top of the head, and then pass to these light beings waiting on the other side of the tunnel. And and then my part of it was done, and then I would feel myself move back through that wormhole and uh, back into my body. And it would take me days to recover from these things. You know, you can only imagine. Um, but uh, my understanding became that wow, you know, I'm, I'm probably consciously unaware of so many aspects of who I am and what I'm doing in multidimensional realities, you know, and probably if I were, like, mentally consciously aware of it, I'd be nuts. <laughs> that might be too much to handle. But um, it, so it made me realize, yeah, it made me realize, well, we are the angels and we are all of these things, you know. Yeah, one thing that made me know that this was about raising awareness, and I think I've always struggled with why do we come to the earth to begin with, and I do think it's something to do with evolving the soul or something, but I also think it has something to do with helping the earth or raising awareness to maybe, you know, to bring the earth to a greater state or humanity or something like that. It's some superhero weird thing. I guess when you're a light being, like, we're going to go to the earth. I'm a superhero. Uh. <laughs> And then when you get here, you're like, oh, crap. <laughs> but uh, the the one thing that, that happened that made me realize it was about raising awareness is when I first started doing a, a radio show, I was mm-hmm. having, well, at first I started doing these little chat room interviews where people would come in a chat room and I would just ask them questions and the audience would ask them questions and there was no audio. And people kept telling me, you should do a radio show, you should do a radio show. And I was like, I don't talk that much. I don't even really like to talk. So finally I decided to do a radio show and I couldn't get any guests. So, I mean, I got a few, but the guests I really wanted, they ignored me. So I said a prayer and I asked to get, you know, guests for the radio show. And then around December, which my birthday is the day after Christmas, uh, I was born in 1974, I remember watching some Christopher Walken movie and some thought goes, uh, go outside and look at the sky. And I was like, I'm not going out there. It's freezing. <laughs> <You're nuts. laughs> but finally I got up and I went out there and I saw these weird red firefly like energy or I don't know what the hell they were, but they were weird. And I screamed for my brother and uh, his son and they came out and they saw them too. It was almost like they, they knew that we saw them and some stopped to observe that we saw them. Well, uh, shortly after that, I ended up getting put on a radio show with something to do with MUFON and told my story. And then shortly after that, the next thing you know, I'm on the phone with Stanton Friedman, who was like someone, you know, he's a ufologist uh, uh, and uh, someone I've seen in documentaries and stuff. And the next thing you know, I'm getting these interviews. Lloyd Pye, Nick Pope. Uh, Lloyd Pye, he's passed away now, but he has that weird alien star child skull that's on all those documentaries and stuff. But the next mm-hmm. thing you know, I'm getting all these interviews with these people like it's nothing. I, I'm talking on the phone with Stanton Friedman, someone I've seen in documentaries who I never thought I'd talk to ever in my entire life. I'm talking on the phone with him for hours. So it was like that. It was connected on some level. Like whatever those weird red things were, they helped me to get interviews or something. It was yeah. weird. It was weird like that. So that's where, where I believe it's about raising awareness. Yeah, and we each do have a mission. We each do. I don't even like to word, use the word mission. It sounds too, I don't know, military. But we each have a purpose. You know, we each have a purpose. I grew up Catholic, so I knew from a young child about vocation. You know, that was kind of your spiritual purpose. And, and so it's always held great meaning for me. And I believe we all have one. And part of the work I do in Chief Shifting into Higher Consciousness and uh, that I teach this summer at Omega and also in the book it's spelled out in the book, people can go through that process themselves, is really helping people to open to their own deeper purpose, you know, for being here. Uh, And once you do that, the support really comes from the heavens, you know, and the earth also. And um, magical things can happen as you describe. 
and uh, so it, it's uh, you know it's really important and and also it is a very human journey. We aren't we are in a body. We aren't light beings without a body. We're in a body. <laughs> We're in this dense reality that it's that is you know wanting to understand its lightness. And that's a journey, you know, that's a real journey. Things move very slowly here sometimes and, you know, and sometimes not. But, um, you know, part of our our evolvement as human beings is to, you know, a lot of people want to kind of eject out of the body and kind of, you know, um, you know, the material and the, the physical just isn't uh, worthy enough, you know. But it, it, to me, it's all about fully embodying our light and really uh, moving deeply into our heart, and that means embracing our difficult feelings and our, uh, you know, the parts of us we have a hard time with, too, and also the parts of our world, that it's it's all part of that light. And um, so it's a different challenge for a light being that's, that's in a body here on earth and and um you know i you know i have the feeling personally that we we come in and you know i was thinking about this you know we're talking about death a lot too and today according to the maya tradition is called kame and kame is um about death and transformation so it's very interesting we're talking so much about that but i was thinking that well i'm 58 and 59 years ago i wasn't here in this form you know, so what a powerful, powerful thing to um, think about, uh, you know, where people can be so afraid to die and what's that and is it the end and what happens after the, well, you know, a year before you, <laughs> before your first birthday, you know, you weren't here. Where were you then, you know? And I feel that, you know, I was conscious of coming in and I think we all were, and we we had something that we came in to offer, you know, to the beauty of the world and the understanding of the world, and and it's time to open to that, and that the circumstances are right, and all of these tragedies playing out around us should be an impetus for us to to really access those places in us, and you're one of those brave characters who really went for it, and you're get you know you've gotten the support you asked for it. you asked for it and you got it definitely uh i guess uh my problem with death is just like uh, i have like i have to be on time for things it's like this appointment that's always just looming over me and i i've been saying prayers to try to think about life more than thinking about death it's and then it's like i have so much cool stuff i have sasquatch statues i have a a giant alien statue someone gave me and, you know, my game consoles and stuff. Just the thought that in this house one day I'm not going to be here and all my stuff is going to outlive me kind of bothers me. <laughs> 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 Unless I could be a light being and come back and play my PlayStation 4. That would be nice. <laughs> yeah, we do get attached, don't we? We get attached to things. But, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, well, uh, one thing that's always interested me a lot about the native uh, folklore is coyote. I have a, a chant I say from DJ Conway, and I think I say it too much. I probably have said it so much I have annoyed coyote. <laughs> but, but it goes, shape changer, uh, trickster, shape changer, keep me from danger, cutting magician, show me your ways of magical fire, powers much higher, leave me to new life, brighten my days. I think it's like my superhero mantra, but I've had some Native American women on before, and uh, they made me a, a quilt, like a Native quilt from two tribes with coyote on it. And now any of those folklore stories and stuff like that, I collect those books. I just love them. Those stories are nuts. I love those stories. <laughs> They're really weird. But I'm kind of curious, uh, with all these tribes and everything you talk about, do they have a coyote-type? character is there a character like that for every tribe or some of them do or some of them don't well i believe so you know and very honestly a lot of my um when for instance in siberia a lot of the the work that i did with people wasn't even verbal work and uh it was all experiencing and moving through ceremonies with them and um you know, it, it was more a hands-on. You know, here in our culture, we're we're used to kind of didactic teaching mode where you have the information and you're going to give it to me. And I'm not a real cerebral person, so I, I'm very experiential. So most of what I learned was experientially through uh, receiving healings and giving healings and 
moving through ceremonies with them and opening to the spiritual energies. And despite what their stories and cosmologies are, um, the most powerful thing I gained from that was that we each have, you know, um, we each have access to spirit directly. And so in Siberia, the, um, the shamans do this very elaborate uh, stone divination process. They go down to the river and they'll ask which stones want to work with them. These are small pebbles um, from the river and they collect 41 or 49 stones. And the interesting thing is that the shaman, um, you know, the, the head shaman won't teach them uh, the, a particular way to do that or a story around that, what they say is you need to go to the river and you need to ask the stones which ones want to work with you, and then you need to talk to the spirits of the stones and ask them how, how to do this. And so as a result, you know, these nine shamans I worked with all had diversely different ways of working with these stones, and this is an elaborate process, too. They have 41 or 49 stones and they're sitting doing a reading for a person and they're moving all these stones around and making little piles and and um, and speaking as they're doing this, what they're gaining, you know, what the stones are telling them from the configurations and um, about the person, you know, about the person's life now and about uh, their destiny. So, um, you know, that's more, <clears throat> more of the training that I received uh, from people in other cultures is... Uh, I didn't necessarily go and collect stories because I've worked with diverse cultures. It was more an experiential process of taking groups to to really uh, go deeply into their ceremonies and rituals and healing processes. Does every tribe use plants on some level, or is that like a rarity? I know in South America they have the crazy ayahuasca stuff, which I've never done that before, but I know that that seems like it has a potential for abuse with, like, tourists and stuff. But I'm curious, does, do a lot of tribes use psychedelic mm-hmm. plants, or is that kind of a rarity? Well, um, the, most of the people I worked with don't. Um, however, in different parts of Siberia, you know, some some of the uh, indigenous people are very connected to mushrooms, depending on where you are. And I did work in the Amazon a lot with the ayahuasca plants. Uh, there's um, actually, you know, it varies. The recipe for ayahuasca varies uh, depending on where you are in the Amazon, whether you're uh, in, in which country, too. But um, <clears throat> in Ecuador there, there were four plants that were married together for the ayahuasca brew, and um, my experience with ayahuasca was very, very um, uh, extreme, and uh, it's uh, an experience I wouldn't repeat. And I was told years later uh, that, um, you know, I was already open spiritually, so I didn't need to do that. It, it's really kind of a crack you over the head and open you process. And uh, in indigenous culture there, it wasn't used, you know, like I hear it used so frequently in certain circles, um, it was used um, very consciously uh, for initiation or for for major passages, um, like a vision quest. You don't do a vision quest even every year. You know, I did a vision quest almost five years ago now in the States, and, and you know, I haven't felt yet that I'm, I'm at the point where I'll do it again because the seeds of what you do at those times can carry you through many, many years, as, and it's important to honor them. But I was able to, in the Amazon, uh, in a very deep jungle setting, um, able to assist uh, many ceremonies with the shamans and John Perkins of ayahuasca and saw some very profound uh, experiences and results for people. Some people who had come who were very, very ill. And it's a powerful process. And I can't imagine myself... um, you know, witnessing or holding that space outside of where the plant actually the plants actually grow. Uh, uh, but I have great respect, you know, for the shamanic people who do that. And I, I have heard, you know, that it's um, in certain circles become a very different process um, ritually. So I, you know, I can't speak to that. My only experience is a very deep, authentic uh, experience in, deep in the jungle. Um, yeah, I used to do like shrooms and stuff like that uh, in my younger years, but uh, 
though I would probably do them if I came across them now, I, there's a part of me that would be afraid I'd end up naked in the highway or in the emergency room. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That's something to consider. <laughs> yeah. And again, little, again, little you know, I've had such profound experiences um, in nature that are, you know, equal or beyond kind of experiences I could have by ingesting something and really encourage people to open to the natural magic of our world. It's so powerful and it's just waiting, all the plants and the animals and are really just waiting to uh, have us open to them. Uh, there's a deep, deep mystery that we live with and deep secrets and mystery within each of us. And now is the time for us to open to those. And um, it really takes some discipline and some open-heartedness and willingness to go out to nature and start talking to the trees and sitting with the trees and taking naps, you know, on the roots of the trees and, and making offerings and, and treating our natural beings around us, um, you know, as um, co-inhabitors of, of this amazing planet uh, and to build those relationships. And magical things happen, you know, and sometimes they're kind of ordinary and magical at the same time. And, and this is what we have to revive here. When the, my first morning in the hoe uh, the other day, I, um, I woke up and before I even left the little hut that I was staying in, I, I telepathically put the word out to nature that I was here and that I was really wanting to connect in whatever way they would like to connect with me. And, and then I walked out onto the gravel bar. It was early 6.37 in the morning and the mists were rising. And it was stunning. It was overwhelmingly beautiful. And I just was stopped in my tracks. And the crows were really loud in this really, really tall tree near where I was standing. And I was just kind of watching them because they were really cackling up the storm. And, um, and then I saw something and I couldn't, and I don't have good vision in my right eye. And I was, I couldn't understand what I was seeing at first, and then I realized I was watching um, two crows had fallen from the top, very top of this tree, and it was tall, and they were spinning in the air. They had latched beaks, and they I saw these four wings spinning round and around, and they were dropping literally through the air. And <clears throat> in spring, you know, I think these are mating rituals. I've seen eagles do this once on Whidbey Island, Washington. And they almost hit the ground, but they release right before they do, and they fly back up. Well, this happened um, as soon as those crows uh, landed on that top branch again. Another pair dropped out of the tree, latched beaks, and spun all the way down through the air. And this happened three times. Now, you know, to me, that's, that's ordinary magic. That's the beauty of nature, you know, as a mirror to to the innocence and um, you know, natural connection that I wanted to make with nature. It's, it's a message, you know, and it's something that we need to pay attention to when when we have an unusual experience in nature or, or even we feel a breeze against our skin or, you know, there are messages in the breezes. I've had many things come through from the breezes off waters, you know, um, yeah. communications and even predictions, you know, uh, about... Uh, hurricanes, you know, and, and tsunamis, you know, there are things that I've known a year or two months in advance about major world occurrences, and those come to me through the elements, and we're all, you know, uh, we can all attune in these ways, and, and um, you know, I don't try hard to make these things happen, I just open to a natural uh, intuition and, and the natural magic of the world, and, and to be very grounded with that, you know. Um, so. And definitely, uh, I've noticed lately with me, uh, with owls, I've had a lot of weird owl experiences lately. Like when I walk through the woods, there's a lot of trails around here. So lately, the owls have been so loud, I can hear them through the house here. And it's really cool. Uh -huh. it's re I, I really kind of like it. It's, it's kind of a, definitely a unique experience for sure. Um, we got about 15 minutes. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about... Uh, where you live at now in Washington in the rainforest, that's where uh, Mick Dodge is at too, right? Yeah, and I'm not living actually in the rainforest right now. I'm a, uh, an hour and a half or so uh, outside of it, but I did for almost two years live 
uh, in the rainforest at the edge of the wilderness. And, uh, yep, that's where Mick Dodge of National Geographic, the legend of Mick Dodge, uh, was born in uh, his homeland. That's and he was my, yeah, yeah he I was my it. forest guide during that time that I lived there. I couldn't have lived there on my own. I had met Mick Dodge on Whidbey Island, Washington. He was living in a tent at the time. And he does this very beautiful, profound uh, physical training, uh, working with the elements and the uh, that he learned from the earth itself. He has profound earth wisdom, so it's an actual physical training um, that he works with sticks and stones and movement, and, uh, and it brings a deep resonance with the earth. He's also known as a barefoot sensei. So I did a lot of training with Mick at the time. And then uh, move, when I moved to the rainforest uh, in early January of 2012, he was my forest guide there. It would have been impossible for me to live there on my own. It was a pretty isolated location. And, uh, yeah. I've become addicted to a show. I'm usually, <laughs> I, I try to walk every day here lately because I'm trying to lose weight because I weigh 260 and I'm six foot two, so I'm trying to... I, I force myself to walk every day now, but I used to be a lot more angrier about it. But I think since watching his show, I'm, I'm, I'm not so much. Usually, I'm like, okay, I'm just I'm walking just so I won't be fat. And there's spiders, mosquitoes. They're eating my flesh. I'm in Florida, so <laughs> oh, there's, okay. there's weird mosquitoes down here that I think the government even lets out that scare me, <laughs> like I'm paranoid about. But uh, his shows definitely help me be a little more cheerful. I think when I go out there and walk the trail and everything. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I've only seen it once because I don't have television, but, um, you know, but, um, yeah, he has profound that, right? you, earth wisdom. Pardon me? You facilitated getting, helping to get the show on that geo, right? Yeah, the story behind that was when we were on Whitby, these two really wonderfully talented young women, Jenny King and Michelle Gomes of Interchange Media in Seattle, had done some filming, they recognized, you know, um, mix um, just unique on him. And their intention was to pitch it, you know, to uh, a major production company. And so time uh, progressed and nothing happened. And, and then uh, we were in the hoe. And um, uh, I, it took months, but eventually Jenny and Michelle Interchange Media uh, were able to catch the attention of some of some bigger some companies to uh, come out and and meet with Mick. So that was very interesting. You know, I was in the Ho um, early in the rainforest early uh, 2012, and we were isolated out there. And then by the end of the year, we had film crews coming out. You know, so my part in that was to really facilitate and. Um, help those relationships, you know, um, with my organization, the Olympic Mountain Earth Wisdom Circle, helping to secure entertainment lawyers and work with contracts and work with film crews and and helping in those ways, you know, for um, that relationship to uh, result in uh, what you're seeing on television now. So, um, yeah, really powerful experience, you know, who would have thought... um, that would happen, but um, and that brings me to an interesting point because I really feel that the whole rainforest called me there. I had dreams before I moved there. I kept having these dreams I talk about in the beginning of speaking with nature of turquoise, the color turquoise, and it was haunting me, and I was going through some medical issues at the time with my eye, and I just couldn't understand it. And then I had asked Mick Dodge to um, take me on a retreat for a few days to the Ho so I could just kind of grapple with this this medical situation I was dealing with and all the anxiety and, you know, life change that I went with that, becoming, you know, half blind almost overnight. Um, and um, I, when I got to the Ho, I saw the turquoise waters and I just knew that was, that was the turquoise that was calling me. And so, you know, when the opportunity came to move to the Ho, I just knew it was the right thing. And um, and then, you know, this dream, the first week I was there about doing a project with Sandra and contacting her and her real enthusiasm to write a book together. And and so, and then, you know, months later, um, you know, by the end of that year, Matt Geo coming in 
and now the ho is seen all over the world, you know, through primetime television, and it's coming out in Sanders in my book. And I really feel that nature is conscious, and it really is calling us home. You know, the earth is calling us home to it. And uh, sometimes we think we're in charge and we're navigating everything. And I know so differently in my life that, you know, I participate. I'm participating with nature. And and that's a good thing because I think there's an intelligence well beyond what I can think myself to. And, you know, I really rely on that intelligence and try to attune with it as much as possible. And barefooting is a really excellent way to do that. You know, you have thousands of nerve receptors at the bottoms of your feet. And so you're really opening to that earth consciousness and energy. And there are many evidence and scientific experiments and proofs and books. Irving's one of them. Great book. Our primary author is Clint Ober, O-B-E-R, about the uh, scientific proof of the energy of the earth is healing for us. And um, so it's uh, uh, the earth is conscious. It's calling us home. And that's part of how we will learn to evolve through these rapidly changing and perilous times is is by opening to that. And yes, you'll get healthy too, and you don't have to think so much about uh, losing weight. It'll happen, you know, and open to that deep union with the earth and make friends with those mosquitoes in some ways, you know. You may yeah, want to yeah. use an, a natural repellent or eat garlic, you know, <laughs> so they're a little repelled. They like but, um, for some reason. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I'm a buffet. They're living beings, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Like, there, there comes the buffet. It's like KFC <laughs> over there for that guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, change your diet, maybe. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I've been trying to eat better. It's a struggle. <laughs> 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 It'll be. It might amaze you if you shift your diet. You know how the mosquitoes react too. You know it's all connected, and whatever we put into us exudes from our pores. And all of nature around us is very, very sensitive to our scents. You know, and to our energy. And you know, it's and we're all connected. So I always ask people uh, on the show. Uh, I even asked the guys about from who did a show on Civil War ghosts this question. So. Kind of my, uh, I have a book out on Sasquatch, and me and Andrew Colvin, who's a specialist on Mothman, uh, we put a book out, and it's all these interviews with people about Bigfoot. It's called Praise for the Hairy Man, The Secret Life of Bigfoot. And it has mm-hmm. perspectives from all different walks of life. Like there's like the hunter types that are out there that would probably shoot it as soon as they could and sell it to a museum, <laughs> which are kind of creepy. But there are also people that think it's like an alien, like all these interviews with different people who are serious about Bigfoot. Of course, I'm a bit comedic about it. I believe there's a Bigfoot, but I, I try to put some humor into it. But I'm kind of curious... You got any uh, secret intel on Bigfoot through your travels? <laughs> well, you know, I've heard um, again the similarities all over the world. That um, certainly in the Northwest, you know, there are stories, and everybody's uh, looking for Sasquatch and Bigfoot. And I know Mick Dodge at one point was when he was running through the forest, and, and his like. beaver suit was mistaken for for Bigfoot. You know, but sure. um, yeah. What? Uh, where he actually, there's one episode where he actually dresses up like Bigfoot to mess with people. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah, again, I don't have television, so, yeah, yeah. And and by the way, I believe characters like Nick Dodge um, come into our reality mirror when, you know, we're, we are in imbalance. We're separate from the earth, so these archetypal characters come in that are kind of like signposts saying, hey, the earth, you know, pay attention, the earth really catches a lot of attention. He's caught world attention. It's really powerful. But, yes, I remember being with John Perkins in Panama with Jane Goodall, and uh, who does, who's done, you know, for so many years, so uh, such beautiful work with animals and chimpanzees and the earth, and talk, talking about um, – the culture, some of the cultures she's worked with and the legends that they have that sound very similar to, you know, other legends in other parts of the world about Sasquatch and Bigfoot. And so, yeah, it's out there in our mythologies. And, you know, you think about dragons. I mean, what was on the planet? What is on the planet? We don't know. There's still deep ocean recesses, you know, that we don't know about, mysterious parts of reality. Um, you know, I think this is uh, really powerful and, and important. There's a lot of mystery and things yet to discover um, 
So I'll have to look at your book. <laughs> Just the fact that when we die, we're a uh, cocoon Ron Howard like being people floating around in space <laughs> is pretty freaking weird. <laughs> Well, we could be many things. You could be doing that now. You could be a light body, you know, having a whole life, some, you know, doing something else right now at the same time. There could be 12 aspects of you. I mean, we could be reincarnated. And who knows? I think we need to open to the vast possibilities and not get tripped out on it, you know, and, and think ourselves to death about it and get weirded out, but just open to possibility and really let that um, settle in our heart and in our body and uh, but, but be very earth-connected at the same time. They're very grounded about it. A lot of people, you know, that I come across aren't very grounded about this, and they're really into the spiritual that, this or that, you know, but we've got to integrate that somehow and um, not be um, ejecting out of our bodies to do it. We have to really embrace um, everyday life and our feelings and our relationships and our world and and bring it all home, you know, and uh, bring a uh, lot more love in. Definitely. Uh, I've learned that by just thinking or saying positive emotions, I'm channeling that energy. Like I go around all day in my head going, love, 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 love joy, 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 happy, 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 <laughs> just trying to channel in that energy, and it works for me. So it's like just thinking about that particular word brings in the energy, so I, I kind of go through it like a carousel every day when I walk. Yeah, words do have energy, and other cultures know that, that every sound, every word has an energy with it. It has a vibration, and it has an impact, you know, so um, it's very important, and we may notice, you know, we have negative uh, thought tracks or feeling tracks to catch when we have those, and to, you know, to shift those. That's a shape shift, you know, shift our our own thought patterns, and we watch the news. If you, I don't, because I don't have television. But you know, we're being fed negatively, left and right, and not that things aren't happening, but the media is skewed, you know. And also, there are a lot of powerful, beautiful things happening, and we don't want to give more bad energy to what's already difficult. We want to give good energy to it. So that's something to think about, you know. When there's a Buddhist practice called Kung Lin, it's taking and sending. It's and suffering and pain and transmuting it into light, love, energy, wisdom, healing, and breathing that out, you know, that's more of what we should be doing is transmuting and um, bringing as much goodness into the world as we can and balance and harmony. Definitely. I think I need to put myself on restriction from the news. Well, well, we're at the uh, end of the show. I just want to thank you uh, for doing the show. I've really enjoyed it, and I appreciate it, and thanks for your patience today with all the, the late stuff that happened uh, uh, earlier, the blah, 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 but we got past that, and I've, I've really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. What What is your, yeah. would you like to give out your web address as well? Yeah, it's lynnroberts.com, L-L-Y-N, roberts.com. The new book with Sandra Ingerman, Speaking with Nature, is released on May 2nd, it's already pre-selling incredibly well on Amazon. You can pre-order it now. And I'll be at the Omega Institute in upstate New York, eomega.org, in August with shapeshifting. And thank All you so right. much, Jeffrey. Well, it's been really wonderful. I really enjoyed it. It was really great. All thank right, you. everybody. Thanks for listening to Church of Mavis uh, radio show. Uh, next uh, Friday is uh, Connie Willis. Uh, she hosts Coast to Coast AM, so that should be a hoop nanny. She also wrote a book about how to win the lottery and uh, something about uh, into remote viewing, so that should be a hoop nanny for sure. Everybody have a good weekend, and thanks for listening. Good night. Thanks, Lynn. Goodbye. Did you hear? Listen to the Church of Mavis radio show, hosted by Jeffrey Pritchett. 7 p.m. Eastern. Friday. Nice. Follow your weird and journey into the high strange. Be sure to stop by 
www.churchofmavisradio.com for upcoming shows, paranormal news, and show archives. That's www.churchofmavisradio.com.